Brooklyn Independent Television. What happens when people with mental health problems break the law? When it comes to punishment, should society take their condition into consideration? That's the idea behind the Brooklyn Mental Health Court, whose presiding judge, Matthew Demick, joins us now. And to tell us more about the peer counseling program at Kings County, we also welcome Dr. Miriam Assange. Thank you both for being here. I want to start by asking you, Judge, to tell us what the Brooklyn Mental Health Court really is. The Brooklyn Mental Health Court is what's known now in modern criminal justice system as a problem-solving court. And that means it seeks to use therapeutic jurisprudence. And that's an idea that came out of Florida where uh, in the court seeks to solve or seeks to help solve certain societal problems in a newer, better way. So when it comes to people suffering from mental illness, uh, thoughtful people in the criminal justice system thought there'd be a better way to keep them out of jail and in treatment. So the You mean instead of punishing them, now you're going to treat them? Well, sort of a hybrid of that, I would say, because what happens is a person is referred to the mental health court in Brooklyn, the first one in the state. Now there's a 20 some odd mental health courts in the state. It's a felony court. Uh, was planned as a felony court. We do take misdemeanors, however. But the way it works is that any judge, any district attorney, any defense attorney can refer a case to the mental health court. Usually the defense attorney hears from the family or sees something going on with the defendant and so uh, would ask the case to be referred. Now, both sides have to agree. The DA's office and the defense attorney have to agree to be in the court. If they both agree, evaluations are done by a psychiatrist that we have a consulting contract with and a social worker who is on our staff. You, you already cleared up one of my misconceptions because I thought felony cases were, were not referred to your court, but it is felony cases. Yeah, of the 200 or so mental health courts in the United States, most are misdemeanor courts. Uh, in Brooklyn, it's kind of unique in the sense that we were planned as a felony court, although planned as a nonviolent felony court for adults, but we've been in operation for eight years now. 40% of our caseload involves people accused of violent felonies. Well, that's my second thing that you've cleared up. I thought it was nonviolent offenses. Well, originally it was planned that way, but it didn't, it, people were referring all sorts of cases to us. So in violent cases, the district attorney's office has a policy of getting the consent of the victim uh, for treatment as opposed to prosecution. And over the eight years, maybe a handful of times, a victim has said no to that. I mean, it's very, the generosity of the people that are the victims of these crimes is amazing to me, that, that they see the benefit of the court as well. Can you give us an example of a, a case that, that you've worked on? I know uh, we can't talk about names, which is not important. Just an example of what kind of case comes before you. Well, well early on in the court, a young man who was in college was referred to the court. I remember talking to an older judge who said to me, not in a flattering way, that all I do is social work, that I'm not really a judge. And I explained to him, this young man, first person in his family ever to go to college, uh, had his first psychotic break, which is not unusual for people in their early 20s. He wound up robbing two people on the street, uh, knocking them down, stealing their pocketbooks, purses, and he, he robbed the first person. She flagged down a police car, and they actually saw him in the act of the second crime. So the DA's office had a very strong case. He went to Rikers Island. He, I don't know, proclaimed himself the son of God or something, and they got beat up. Clearly mentally ill. Yes, he was delusional. He, he went to Kings County Hospital for treatment of his physical injuries, but they realized that he was suffering from schizophrenia. So he, the case was referred to the court. He took a plea of guilty, which is a price of admission to the court, and agreed to a jail term up front. Because of the violent nature of the crime and that there were two crimes involved, the district attorney's office insisted rather than a dismissal, which would be the normal uh, protocol in these cases for a first felony defender, they wanted misdemeanor probation if he successfully completed the, his treatment mandate. What happened was he did so well. I remember he came in with his father every week, because I see the defendants every week, especially in the beginning. He was studying graphic design. He brought some of his, actually, his artwork with him, and it was really very, very good. In any event, he came in with his father. The poor father looked like he was lost. This great kid uh, now had this illness, and he didn't know what to do. In any event, he was with us for a year and a half. And his mother wrote a letter to me and to District Attorney Hines asking that the case be dismissed. You mean dismissed that he 
the, the probation part after would be thrown out? That's right. There would be okay. no probation, just a straight dismissal. What happened was he stayed with us an extra six months. He did fabulously, and his case was dismissed. And the last I heard, he was getting his master's degree in graphic design. So uh, Clearly a case where your uh, intervention, the intervention of the court that you had, uh, made it better for him and for society. Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 people suffering from mental illness who are untreated in prison uh, don't come out any better. In I, my opinion, society is safer when you have a system where somebody is forced to go into treatment, stays in treatment, and, uh, and does well. Everybody wins. Dr. <laughs> Assange, I am um, very interested in how your peer counseling and the courts, how we, how we mesh you, and I, I think because what you do benefits society as well. Peer counseling, would you describe what your peer counseling involves? Well, the peer counselors, uh, they are, as actually our deputy executive director referred to them, ambassadors of empathy. They, are, they come in to work with uh, recipients of care to, um, to be companions to them, to be able to help them orient, to care, telling them about the expectations for treatment, and just by their very being positive role models to show that you too, look at me, I was able to, um, to recover, and so you too can, just by their so very presence. So you mean presence. they are people who've suffered from mental illness. That's right. Who counsel people who are now being treated for That's mental right. illness. And they're well on their way um, they are advanced in their own recovery that makes them able to give back and to share. And as a matter of fact, doing so um, also helps them in their own recovery. So it's not just helping the current consumer in care, but also helping themselves. There's one question that I have that I must bring up, and then I'll get right back on your two programs. Um, one of the things that happens when people go to peer counseling programs is that you have to be concerned about confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And that's always a major concern. And although people think of Brooklyn as a huge city, we are really just a series of little small towns. What is done uh, to protect people's confidentiality? Well, let me just first say that peer counselors are employees, health care employees, bound by the same rules of con confidentiality as any other healthcare provider. So they so, know all about HIPAA, no difference. That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Now, do you ever use people as peer, count do you ever use peer counselors? Well, we take interns as peer counselors from Harry the Harp program in Harlem. And Harry? Uh, Howie. Howie? Howie the Harp. Howie the Harp or Howie T. Harp. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's a very, very good program uh, running the city. And so we take counselors from them. We have a, uh, uh, relationship with them, uh, which I think is a very good one, and uh, so we enjoy that. And I think that the people that they send to us get a benefit out of it, and uh, we get a benefit as well. So now they are people who have uh, mental illness diagnoses, yes. who have been treated, and what makes them special to come to you? Well, that's uh, my project director, Lucille Jackson, and the director of the Howie the Hawk program work that out. I mean, I'm not really involved in that, but... But uh, do they know anything about criminal justice or anything like that that well, makes them special? I think or just mental illness like the ones that... Well, that's why they come to us. I mean, they have a peer advocacy program. They send us, an in, you know, somebody that works for us as an intern. They work closely with my clinical staff and uh, rotate you know, in that way. I don't know if I should add to this, though I'm not a part of that program, but how we THAP train forensic peer specialists, and these are individuals who themselves not only have experienced mental illness, but also have been through the penal system. Uh, okay. So they've had that experience. So they have, yes. they have experience in both the mental, the health part That's right. and the legal part. That's right. Very well, specialized peers. Please. My question was whether or not society should take into effect people's mental Ill health diagnoses when sentencing is done. And you've already talked about one aspect that people who are victims of crime have to agree to put it in your court as opposed to a, a court that meets out punishment. 
and that most people do that. Is that correct? Yes. So it seems to me, based on what you've said, that people in society are willing. Do you find that in general um, across the board? Well, I'm hoping. I mean, one of the things I think is good about the mental health court is that I see the people every week. It's very labor intensive. And I, I never thought of this eight years ago when we started, but it also creates a destigmatized community in the courtroom. These defendants get to know each other. They see who gets rewarded, who gets sanctioned, who gets reprimanded, who's doing well, who's doing poorly. They root for each other. And that's an effect that I, I, I never even thought about, but I find to be very uplifting. And, you know, let's face it, we all know everybody that you know knows a family that has somebody suffering from physical illness, and everybody knows a family that suffering, has somebody suffering from mental illness. Traditionally in society, you know, we act, react with somebody suffering from physical illness with compassion and concern, Absolutely. and yet when somebody's suffering from mental illness with fear and misunderstanding, and I think that like Dr. Assange's program, and I hope the mental health court, uh, is helping society to change that. To destigmatize right. de mental stigmatize. illness because it definitely impacts people's willingness right. to get care. To get care. So is that, does your peer counselors being out there in the community um, help people in terms of the stigma as well? well Definitely. They, they are not in the community right now, though some outreach is done um, in, with the peer counselors who work in the outpatient service. But for those who come to our door for care, they have an opportunity to connect with everyone who comes in our doors for care, for care meet and interact with, with a, peer a peer counselor. I just have a, one other question we, in the time we have left. What happens when a person doesn't adhere to treatment, doesn't take their medication? You know, even people who have physical ailments are not consistent with their medication. And so their blood pressure may go up or their, or their diabetes be out of control. It only hurts them. When a person who is a violent offender, 40% of your people, don't adhere to treatment, what happens to them? Well, obviously we like to give a lot of chances. And, uh, but I, I will say, just to start out, that as of today, 88% of the people in the court, which accounts for probably about 137 people, are in complete compliance with their mandate. But there have been That's occasions. a very good record. It's very good. Mm -hmm. it's, and we have about an 80% graduation rate, too, over eight years. So, you know, there's a study being done by the Urban Institute now. I want to see what an independent group says about the court, but we'll know that in a couple of months. But what I will say is, if I determine that the balance between public safety and the needs of the defendant uh, is, is weighed in the public safety sphere, then the person has already agreed to a jail sentence on a plea of guilty and I'll impose sentence on him. We're going to have to stop it there. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Download this program's podcast on iTunes, keywords Brooklyn Independent Television.